Hi, this is Matt Baker. Welcome to episode 7 in my series on Christian denominations. I had originally planned for this to be the last episode, but after adding everything to the chart that I wanted to add, I decided that I'm going to need an episode 8 as well. So in today's video, I'm going to cover the Holiness Movement, as well as the Pentecostals and Charismatics. And then in the final video, I'm going to cover a bunch of miscellaneous topics, such as Christian science, African-initiated denominations, Chinese house churches, and Messianic Jews. So this gives you one last chance to make any comments that might impact the final design of the chart. Unfortunately, this also means that I've had to delay the official launch of the poster to June 23rd. That's when episode 8 will come out and when you'll finally be able to place your order. Now, before I dive into today's topic, I want to show you how you can do some research into your own family tree, and in particular, how you can find out which denominations your ancestors belong to. This is actually fairly easy to do, thanks to today's sponsor, MyHeritage. You can begin by making a simple tree using the names of your parents and grandparents. My Heritage will then help you grow your tree even further by automatically giving you discovery links. Using this method, I was able to get the name of my great-great-great-grandfather, Andrew Baker. But what if I want to know what his religion was? Well, all I have to do is click on his box and then select Research This Person. This then connects me to the over 19 billion records that my heritage gives me access to. Next, I'm going to choose Census Lists, Canadian Census, and finally 1871 Census, which was the very first census taken after the country of Canada was created. And here I was able to learn that my great-great-grandfather was a Methodist. I can even view the original document. Note that it says W. Meth which stands for Wesleyan Methodist. If you'd like to research more about your own ancestors, MyHeritage is offering Useful Charts viewers a 14-day free trial, followed by 50% off a premium membership. You can sign up right now by using the link in the description or pinned comment. Okay, so last time I talked about the Second Great Awakening, which gave rise to the Restorationists, Mormons, Millerites, and Plymouth Brethren. This time I'm going to talk about the Third Great Awakening, which mostly grew out of the Holiness Movement, which in turn grew out of the Methodists. As I mentioned in Episode 5, one of the distinct features of Methodism is the idea of a second work of grace, also known as entire sanctification. According to Methodists, this is the process by which a Christian is transformed into becoming a more perfect and holy person. Now, initially, this was understood to be a gradual process. In other words, it was something that occurred slowly, over time. However, in the mid-1800s, some Methodists, such as the female preacher Phoebe Palmer, started promoting the idea that entire sanctification can also occur instantaneously. This marked the beginning of the Holiness Movement which initially started as a movement within the Methodist Church, but then eventually resulted in the creation of new denominations. The earliest holiness denomination was the Wesleyan Methodist Church. It was formed in the U.S. in 1841, when the main Methodist Church failed to take a firm stand against slavery. The new denomination also became a strong supporter of women in ministry. In fact, it was the president of the Wesleyan Methodist Church who ordained Antoinette Brown Blackwell, the first female minister in the United States. The second holiness denomination was the Free Methodist Church, formed in the U.S. in 1860. It too broke away from the Main Methodist Church, this time over several issues, one of which was the practice of renting the best pews to the rich. Then, in 1865, over in the UK, the Salvation Army was established by the Methodist couple William and Catherine Booth. A lot of people tend to think of the Salvation Army as more of a charitable organization, being that they're mostly known for collecting money for the poor around Christmas time and for running second-hand stores. But the Salvation Army is actually a Protestant denomination as well, complete with ministers and Sunday services although they prefer to call their ministers officers, and they give them ranks that are similar to military ranks. 
However, it was in the 1880s that the holiness movement really took off, with dozens of new denominations forming, eight of which I've named on the chart. This coincided with the start of the Third Great Awakening, which also involved some new denominations that had nothing to do with Methodism. One such denomination is the Church of God, Anderson, Indiana. Anderson is the location of their headquarters, and this is often added to their name in order to distinguish them from the many other denominations that use the name Church of God as well. In particular, the Church of God, Cleveland, Tennessee, which we'll get to in a bit. For now, let me point out the main difference. The Church of God, Anderson, is a holiness denomination, whereas the Church of God, Cleveland, is a Pentecostal denomination. Basically, what that means is that the Church of God Anderson does not allow the speaking in tongues during worship, whereas the Church of God Cleveland does. I'll be explaining what speaking in tongues is in a moment, but for now, just take note that while many holiness denominations went on to become Pentecostal, not all did. And the Church of God Anderson is a good example of one of those that did not. Another holiness denomination that did not become Pentecostal is the Church of the Nazarene. It was formed by a merger in 1908 between an earlier church, called the Church of the Nazarene, and the Association of Pentecostal Churches of America. In addition to these two churches, more than a dozen other holiness denominations, not shown on this chart, ended up joining them as well. Interestingly, they were originally called the Pentecostal Church of the Nazarene. But that was before the word Pentecostal came to refer to those who speak in tongues. Once the Pentecostal movement became firmly established, the Nazarenes dropped the word Pentecostal from their name in order to avoid confusion. I also want to point out the Wesleyan Church, which was formed in 1968 when the Wesleyan Methodist Church merged with the Pilgrim Holiness Church. Another movement that occurred around the same time as the Holiness Movement was the Higher Life Movement, which started at a gathering in Keswick, England. It led to the creation of the Christian Alliance and the Evangelical Missionary Alliance, which then merged in 1897 to create the Christian and Missionary Alliance. I'll mention them again a bit later. Let me now introduce you to the Pentecostals. The word Pentecost means 50th and it refers to the Jewish festival of Shavuot, which is always observed on the 50th day after Passover. According to the New Testament book of Acts, it was on this day, 50 days after the death of Jesus, that the Holy Spirit descended upon his disciples, allowing them to, quote-unquote, speak in tongues. Now, for most Christians, this is interpreted as a miracle in which people who spoke foreign languages were suddenly able to understand what the disciples were saying. However, Pentecostals interpret it differently. Pentecostals believe that in addition to suddenly being able to speak in a different human language, speaking in tongues can also refer to the sudden ability to speak in a heavenly language. They think that this is what Paul was referring to in 1 Corinthians 13 when he said he was able to speak in tongues of men and of angels. Let me give you a quick example of what this can sound like. So here's the thing. All Christians believe in a first work of grace, in which a believer experiences justification, meaning that they are, in an instant, made right with God. Holiness Christians add to this a second work of grace, in which a believer experiences entire sanctification meaning that they are, in an instant, made holy and perfect. While the early Pentecostals added to this a third work of grace, in which a believer experiences, again, in an instant, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the evidence of which is that the believer is now able to speak in tongues. The first person to connect the ability to speak in tongues with the baptism of the Holy Spirit was a man named Charles Parham. However, it is one of his former students, William J. Seymour, who I think deserves the title, founder of Pentecostalism. Seymour was the main person behind the Azusa Street Revival, an event that started in 1906 and which sparked the Pentecostal movement. It took place in downtown Los Angeles, in what is today Little Tokyo. Back then, on a small lane called Azusa Street, stood this old building, 
which was once an AME church but had been converted into a stable. Seymour rented the building and pretty soon crowds started showing up and word began to spread about strange things that were happening there. People were shouting and speaking in tongues and supposedly some people were getting healed. But perhaps the biggest miracle was the fact that even though this was the height of the Jim Crow era, the crowds consisted of both blacks and whites, rich and poor, educated and illiterate. Immigrants from Asia and Latin America were there, along with Native Americans, and Christians from all churches dropped by to check it out. There were Baptists, Methodists, Quakers, Presbyterians, etc. But not everyone was happy about what was happening. The Los Angeles Times ran a story about a new sect of fanatics breaking loose, and another paper described it as follows. They make howling noises all day and into the night. They run, jump, shake all over, shout to the top of their voice, spin around in circles, fall out on the sawdust blanketed floor, jerking, kicking, and rolling all over it. These people appear to be mad, mentally deranged, or under a spell. But despite the controversy, Pentecostalism did not fade away. In fact, it continued to grow at an exponential pace. Many of the new holiness denominations ended up becoming Pentecostal denominations, such as the mostly black Church of God in Christ and the mostly white Camp Creek Holiness Church, which split into the Church of God Cleveland and the Church of God of Prophecy. There was also the Fire Baptized Holiness Church and the Pentecostal Holiness Church that merged to form the IPHC, or International Pentecostal Holiness Church. But the largest Pentecostal denomination ended up being the Assemblies of God. It was formed in 1914, when some of the original participants of the Azusa Street Revival, calling themselves the Apostolic Faith Movement, merged with a group of white ministers who left the Church of God in Christ, as well as a large chunk of members who left the Christian and Missionary Alliance. The Assemblies of God differs from other Pentecostal denominations in that it holds to a finished work doctrine. Basically, this is the belief that both justification and sanctification occur simultaneously, and therefore the three-stage teaching of other Pentecostals is reduced back to two. There's just the initial conversion, followed by the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is evidenced by speaking in tongues. However, there's a third type of Pentecostal as well. These are the oneness Pentecostals, and I've placed them in the non-Nicene box because they reject the Trinity, instead believing that God is only one person, Jesus. In 1917, some members left the Assemblies of God to join the Pentecostal Assemblies of the World, which is the main oneness Pentecostal denomination. Two other denominations later split from them, and they eventually merged to form the United Pentecostal Church International. The next Pentecostal group I want to point out is the Four Square Church, founded in 1923 by a woman named Amy Semple McPherson. The Four Squares represent the idea that Jesus is Savior, Baptizer, Healer, and King. McPherson was an early example of a faith healer, something that is associated with Pentecostalism to this day. She drew large crowds, with people often bringing the sick in on stretchers, and many claiming to leave healed. However, like many of the faith healers today, her career plummeted after a major controversy. In 1926, she was allegedly kidnapped and went missing for five weeks. But later, she was accused of setting the whole thing up herself, either as a publicity stunt or to hide an affair that she was having. To this day, the truth of the matter is not known. Now, something else that was happening around the same time that not only impacted Pentecostalism, but Christianity as a whole, was the fundamentalist versus modernist debate. The late 1800s and early 1900s saw major advances in the fields of science, archaeology, and textual criticism. Therefore, many biblical scholars started to understand the Bible in a more literary way, rather than as a primary source for straightforward history and science. This led to the divide I mentioned in a previous episode between the more liberal, mainline denominations and the more conservative, evangelical denominations. On the evangelical side were those who called themselves fundamentalists. 
This term comes from the 1910 book called The Fundamentals, which among other things emphasized that the Bible should be understood in a literal way. Generally speaking, most Pentecostals as well as most Baptists stuck to a more fundamentalist approach to the Bible going forward, whereas the mainline denominations adopted a more modernist approach, creating a divide within Christianity that exists to this day. Now, before I leave Pentecostalism, I want to point out one denomination that actually originated outside of the US. This is the Apostolic Church, which grew out of the Welsh revivals of 1904 and 1905. I should also mention that all of these Pentecostal denominations went on to plant churches all over the world, so much so that Pentecostals, taken as a whole, now make up the second largest group within Christianity after the Roman Catholics. I now want to turn my attention towards the Charismatics, who are often lumped together with the Pentecostals, but are actually a bit different. The largest Charismatic Church is actually the Universal Church of the Kingdom of God in Brazil. The Charismatic Movement started in the 1960s as sort of a second wave of Pentecostalism. But this time, rather than leading to new denominations, it mostly just led to some people within older denominations embracing a new style of Christianity. So nowadays within the Anglican Church and even the Roman Catholic Church, you can find certain congregations that look a lot like Pentecostal churches. In these cases, we would call those congregations charismatic. This could mean that the members there speak in tongues, either publicly or privately, but it could also just mean that the music and worship style they use is more similar to the worship you'd find in a Pentecostal church. So I suppose you could think of charismatic churches as being a kind of Pentecostalism light. The Christian and Missionary Alliance is a good example. While they see speaking in tongues as being valid, they do not require it or see it as a necessary sign. The word charismatic is related to the Greek word for gift. So often charismatics will focus on other kinds of spiritual gifts instead. Now, in addition to the charismatic Christians that exist within existing denominations, there are also many so-called non-denominational churches that would be best classified as belonging to the charismatic movement. Which brings me to an important point. Although this is now the seventh episode in my series on Christian denominations, I've not once stopped to define the word denomination. The main reason for this is that while it can be a difficult word to define, most of us have an intuitive understanding of what it means. Some would argue that the Roman Catholic Church is not a denomination. Likewise, many would argue that Baptist churches are not part of any denomination, nor are Churches of Christ or Quaker meetings and so on. But in this series, I've been using the word denomination in a fairly loose way to refer to any grouping of Christians based on shared characteristics and or shared history. Ready to Harvest actually has a great video on what is a denomination that goes into this topic in greater detail. So if you want to know what I mean when I use the word denomination, I suggest that you watch his video, which I'll link to in the description along with a video he released just today about Pentecostals. Which brings me to the point I want to make about non-denominational churches. Non-denominational churches are not really non-denominational. Most of the newer ones have a lot in common and started to spring up around the same time. So basically, we could lump most of these non-denominational churches together into a denomination of their own. And that denomination would probably fit best under the charismatic umbrella. Some examples of this would include the British New Church Movement in the UK and the many churches associated with Calvary Chapel, the original Calvary Chapel having started as a breakaway from the Four Square Church. Its founder, Chuck Smith, was associated with the Jesus Freaks of the 1960s, who were kind of the Christian version of hippies. He also founded Maranatha Music, which to this day produces a lot of the worship songs used in churches all over the world. Some people see the rise of the charismatic movement in the 60s and 70s as a fourth great awakening, but the use of that term is debatable, so I've chosen not to use it on this chart. 
Okay, so that's where I'm going to leave things for today. There are still several topics to discuss, and that's why there will be an episode 8 released on June 23rd, which is also the date that I'll be releasing the poster. However, before I go, I do want to point out one change to the chart that I decided to make. A lot of people requested that I remove the Westboro Baptist Church, which I had mentioned in episode 5. Initially, I didn't want to remove them because I felt that they were notable, and I didn't want to be an arbitrator of who is or is not a Christian, even though in the case of Westboro Baptist Church, virtually everyone agrees that they are more of a hate group than a church. But eventually someone who I believe is a veteran convinced me that they should go. So they're gone as are the FLDS and the Branch Davidians, although in those two cases it was mostly about them being so small and there simply being not enough room to include them. Okay, so that was a look at the Holiness Churches, the Pentecostals, and the Charismatics. Stay tuned for one last episode, and if you have any suggestions based on what you've seen so far, do let me know in the comments. Thanks for watching.